Because staring at Marie is the high quality content you've come here to see, I want to show you that her uh, parasol, I almost called it an umbrella, but that would not hold up in water quite well, uh, is Cuddle Gear brand, and her kimono is a uh, Tony Kenza brand. Yeah, Tony Kenza. Hey everybody, it's Chugga Conroy. Welcome back to more Splatoon 2. Last time, we got to meet the Kenza, uh, the Kenza, uh, the uh, Tenetech splatter shot among the other splatter shots. Yes, that's what I mean. Uh, this time, we're gonna be going up around. Oh, no, 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 we're not. It's behind the box, it's behind the box. We've already been up there and there was nothing up there. Tedium, thy name is Shooting Shields. Give me this. Getting this nice view of Octo Canyon, we go down to Sunset Octocopter, dash and jump. Whenever people are rude to me, I call them anus copters. I just think that's a quirky thing to call them. So uh, I guess in this universe, I can call them octocopters and uh, not have to worry about the age rating. Is anus a word that you can't say without, um, you know, invoking an age rating? Because it is just part of the body, and you can say butt, and I think you can say butthole. Uh, I don't know if anus is a word that is not a lot. Someone needs to get on that and have a cartoon character that calls people anuses, because that would be really funny. Uh, do that. Hop over there, get on that ink rail. These types of ink rails always move you forward. Those conveyor belts also uh, force you into a jump. Pop that. In case we fall down, we can always paint the walls to get back up. I'm gonna take care of you. Grab me some eggs that I will suck into myself. Hop on this, do a little trick. Yeah, that was not a very, uh, that wasn't a very poggin trick, I think is what skaters are saying these days. Uh, you there are an octocopter. We have heard much about you, as in we've heard about you once from the stage name. I'll grab my armor. That there is a gusher. It's a type of hazard that will instantly destroy my armor if I get anywhere near it, hence why they're giving it to you for free. It's like in Sonic, if they're giving you a life for free, you know something terrible is coming. Go up, go up, go up. Take you. Wow, that was further away than I thought. I got double armor. Oh, I got I got like a galaxy brain thing going on with my helmet. That's nice. Got that. Gonna go over there and get my sardinium. And almost missed that jump. Octocopters. Octocopters. Oh, <laughs> almost took off my toenails there. I'll grab triple armor. Unfortunately, there is no quad armor. I think three is as high as it goes, or is it two? Yeah, I think it's two actually is the highest that it goes. I don't notice any difference now. I'm trying to get a nice good look at this power up as you can't get it in verses. It's only in uh, this. Uh, let's just toss a bomb here. Take care. Killjoys. Climb balls faster by mashing B while you climb. Good tip. Uh, gonna hop off. Yeah, there we go. Get about 600 points for that in Sonic Adventure 2 if that's what we were playing. And pop that. Stingray. Okay. So, thing about specials in Octo Canyon. Specials were updated over time. Stingray was god awful at launch. Look at this. There's a weak little stream of ink that just does little bits of damage over time. I couldn't even kill regular enemies with that. Not all of them, at least. And. Yeah, so nothing was ever updated. Splashdown is uh, invincible for longer. Uh, the Tena missiles have longer animations. A lot of specials have been adjusted since launch. And if you ever wanted to get an idea for what things were like, oh, uh, that is a um, a Twintical Octo Trooper is its name. It has better mobility and more shooting than a normal Octo Trooper. Come on, get it, get it, get it, get it, get it. Okay, 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 got it. Oh, that was the same guy. I thought there was a second one that came down and that was what I was fighting. Uh, gotta have some fun. Woo! As I was saying before, I was rudely interrupted. If you ever wanted to get an idea of what the game was at launch, play Octo Canyon. It wasn't updated over time. A lot of weapons function as they did in 1.0. Picking up lots of calories along the way as we go through the rings. And once all these are gone, zoom, 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 zoom. Pow! There it is! I didn't get the sunken scroll! Huh. 
Ah, it's fine. That was a fun stage. I'd be happy to play it again. When playing a stage again! The Sardinium, or Sunken Scrolls, any kind of one-time collectible, turns into more eggs. It took me three attempts to find this, right over by the Wall of Death, is this little itty-bitty platform, and then on this wall is a conveyor with the Sunken Scroll on top. Well hidden. Quite well hidden. Also, those are on a different layer than the pistons. They actually didn't destroy it. It was just at the same time as the bomb, so it looked like that. I'm learning everything. Boom. We're moving! Ammo Knights will be moving to a new location soon. Many thanks to our loyal customers for your support. That was it. A crummy commercial. Back in Inkopolis Square, we are meeting under the Deka Tower like some kind of romantic couple. The new gameplay mechanic of the day is Recon Mode, one of the most helpful things that I can give you. Press Y on the current map rotation to see it. There are a grand total of about 80 maps in Splatoon 2, if we are counting the maps that change their terrain across different modes. That's a lot of information to keep straight, and while the map rotations don't have too many of these legal at any given month, just to keep it kind of consistent, uh, it's still a lot to keep straight, and you could always benefit from going in here and being like, oh wait, how does this map change based on the current rotation? Because they'll put uninkable services in certain places, they'll put more obstacles in others, just to prevent certain modes from breaking. It's a lot. There is nothing to be lost by going in, getting familiar, and then lacing up for the fights. Speaking of which, it's time for us to meet a new weapon, the one we're gonna be playing today, in case you didn't know. Dun dun. Dun dun. Dun dun. You wanna see something new? Well, what other shooter game allows you to attack using a paint roller? Platoon 1, that's what. This is a melee weapon that specializes in covering the ground very fast. Every roller's regular attack has two phases. It starts off as a fling that insta-kills on a direct hit with the center of the roller. Then optionally, if the button is held, a roll that instantly kills anyone unfortunate enough to run into it. Let's talk about these one at a time. Flinging on the ground covers a wide area and is meant for close range attacks. At point-blank range, it's very likely to exceed 100 damage. As with any weapon, additional distance outside the effective range results in damage falloff, but in the case of a roller with it being such a large area of attack, distance away from the center of the roller also results in damage falloff. The minimum possible damage in a single attack is 35. In the air, however, the roller switches to a vertical stance. This turfs less ground and is harder to land a hit with, but is rewarded with longer range and higher minimum damage. The range on the roller is actually very good despite appearing to be a melee weapon, and the vertical fling outranges many common shooters. Because of that vertical range, it makes for a good spacing tool from foes that have noticed you, can make long thin lines of ink to swim through, or long thin lines up walls to swim up them quickly. Every attack from a roller has a wind-up time, and all that determines the fling type is if the player was in the air at the time of pressing ZR. So vertical flings can be done on the ground if done just before landing, and horizontal flings can be done in the air if ZR is pressed and then you jump. Regardless of the stance, every single roller fling is very ink-hungry, consuming 9% base ink and requiring a reload every 11 attacks. This sounds like it wouldn't be unforgiving at all, but remember that if an attack misses, you might be forced into attacking repeatedly to keep spaced out from the enemy. Getting even a little trigger happy can result in being out of ink often. As a final mode-specific property, roller flings are a much more limited method of attacking in tower control due to the spire in the center of the tower blocking attacks. As for how the roll works, it must always follow a fling by continuing to hold ZR and is a very fast way to move around and cover new ground. The roll speed and handling of a roller is based on the roller-specific stats of... ink speed and handling. While it sounds fun to run people over, and uh, trust me, it feels great when they just swim into you at random, that's often out of your control and not what it's primarily for. The most important thing to know about rolling is that rolling into enemy ink sucks. Rollers don't get continuous fire, and a thin trail of ink makes it vulnerable from all sides. One miss, or just one squid coming to their aid, and your rush is over. It does have applications in fights, being quicker than a second fling for little corrections, or to be a less noisy approach than just flinging at the opponent repeatedly if you think they can be gotten with a roll anyway. Now that we understand the basic rules, 
there's generally two roles that a roller fulfills. Stealth and painting. Rollers do well at picking off frontline fighters who don't see it coming, mainly hiding in ink in hard to reach places and getting the jump on the enemies. This is referred to as sharking. Any weapon can do this, but it's commonly seen on assassin type weapons like this. When sharking, wait till they're up close so they're easier to hit. A vertical fling can be difficult to hit with from far away. It's generally better to hide in the ink, make sure you have the advantage, and take an easy shot with a horizontal attack. Make your attacks count. Don't just throw yourself at enemies that can already see you. They will swim back and outmaneuver your attacks in any way that they can. A part of the roller's identity is attacking above it, something that weapons can't usually do easily. Due to the way the ink comes out, it can even attack up on ledges up close. If sharking's the way you want to go, a lot of maps put ledges for rollers to hide on just outside a center to drop onto people's heads. When it comes to painting, being honest with you, I think this roller is far more suited for fighting than painting. There are safer and faster working weapons at turfing the ground. This one's not bad by any stretch, it's the standard all-around roller and can definitely make use of its powers to cover lots of ground in turf wars, but I consider it only of importance when gaining map control is imperative to being able to accomplish a goal. In fact, a lot of its painting will come from fighting normally because its sub-weapon is the curling bomb. They treat curling just like it's a real sport. It travels in a straight line, leaving a trail of ink in its wake, bouncing off any vertical surface it hits, and then slows down to a stop and explodes. The distance traveled is based on how long the button is held. Holding the R button cooks the little portable stove growing larger, and it travels slower and goes less distance as it grows, but also gains a larger blast radius, explodes sooner after deployment, and has a fatter trail of ink. To get a feel for how this works, the circle of LEDs on top is actually a countdown for the explosion and is a good training tool to learn the timing. Running over an enemy hits for 20 damage and keeps traveling. Minus a few toes. Splash damage bottoms out at 30, and a direct hit is 180, the highest object damage in the game other than a suction bomb. It's certainly a weird sub-weapon that can take a lot of practice to get used to. But it throws ink all around, pressures from a distance, makes pathways, and can even trap foes from swimming away with its lines of ink. Curling bombs should always be thrown at the start of a match and at the end of a match. At the start, it's a great way to help the entire team swim to the center of the map and get a first push going early before the other team arrives. Trust me, you'll be getting some booyahs for that one. At the end of a turf war, it'll cover a lot of ground and then explode after the time limit is over as long as it's been thrown and can be the difference to win the game. One final mode-specific tip for curling bombs is to deploy it just before grabbing the Rainmaker for easy points. As for what this does for the Splat Roller, making those ink trails is so central to how the Splat Roller as a whole fights. It's much better to throw a curling bomb, then swim behind it, than it is to roll a long, thin line through enemy ink. Swim speed is always better than roll speed. They can't easily see you doing this due to there being ripples behind the curling bomb anyway. And it allows a roller to fling right away instead of leaving you wide open as it would from a roll. Launching a curling bomb in order to approach a target without having to announce your presence is as good as it gets. If you're thinking direct, that's one dimensional. Many experienced players already know that splat rollers love to do this, so they might be preemptively shooting at a curling bomb to test you, and it can be just as effective to launch a curling bomb that you want them to see, swim around from the other side, and hit them while they're busy checking the curling bomb. Because of the great mobility, generally not cooking the bomb is the way to go in order to do this. Cooking has its uses when it can be used to trap foes at close range or uninkable surfaces, but not much else. This is a main sub combination that's definitely fun to use. It makes playing the roller endlessly more fun and strategic than it would be alone, and that's what a good sub weapon should do. A lot of the weapons that have curling bombs are more on the fighty side and either short or mid range, so the Splat Roller is a great example of how curling bombs work in general. As for sub power up, it raises speed and travel distance. Also, not very useful. Its special weapon is the Splashdown! With the roller playing stealth so often and hiding up on ledges, this is great. It can be used to jump off said ledges and get the jump on multiple targets, or just to super jump to somebody already in a fight and then throw a curling bomb to get away thanks to the free reload. Conversely, a curling bomb is also an opportunity to approach unsuspecting foes quickly with a splashdown, even cutting off their getaway with the trail of ink that the bomb leaves behind. The special charge is 170, making it pretty average for splashdown costs, but again, it's pretty good at covering the ground too. 
A general tip that I'd like to talk about with this weapon in particular is checking the map often. When it's sharking and doesn't have anything in particular to do, the map can show where enemies are going, can show where to super jump to with that splashdown, or it's actually possible to use a main weapon just before landing from a super jump, meaning that rollers can effectively skip their wind-up phase and smoosh someone on the way down. Not to mention, the free reload from a super jump means another curling bomb if you want to use it for that. All parts of this weapon have more benefit than usual to checking the map. The Splat Roller is your quintessential melee weapon. It might not be the strongest weapon due to its limited capabilities and some weird quirks about how the main weapon works, but it manages to be fun and unique for those who enjoy the roller class. In particular, the Curling Bomb is likely to score free points if deployed just before grabbing the Rainmaker, or just to get to the goal quickly in Clan Blitz where it's likely to score free points. In the way of equipment, there's a new ability on the block, and its name is Ninja Squid, found only on shirts. This turns any ripples made by swimming on the ground invisible in return for 10% of a weapon's default swim speed. However, ripples on walls are still visible, as are the slight indentation left in the ink. Ripples are produced with very slow speeds in Splatoon 2, so this is a very valuable ability that cannot be replaced by merely swimming slower. Naturally, movement speed is important, and when hearing that you're going to lose some of it, you might think, well, what about swim speed up? Does that make up for it? Well, you'd be right. Lightweight weapons need two mains and three subs of swim speed up to mitigate this 10% loss and return to normal. Middleweights, like the Splat Roller, need only seven sub slots, and heavyweights need only one main and one sub. To avoid detection and play further mind games with the Curling Bomb, Ninja Squid is a good addition to the set. An ability worth running a sub slot or two of is Special Saver. This is a stackable ability with the simple effect of less special gauge lost upon death. Should you die during a splashdown execution, normally you lose 25% of the special gauge, but with only one sub of Special Saver, that becomes 16%. Two subs becomes 10%. With the roller having to get in close to make sure its attacks land, this is a great ability for it. <sighs> okay, fine. I've been putting it off. The effect of main power up on splat rollers is damage up. And yes, I want to recommend it. Running just a little bit can mitigate some of that damage fall off. Our sucky shout out of the day goes to run speed up. It seems like it would improve the roll speed, but no, that's not a running animation, it's an attack. Yeah, that's right. Your feet help a jetpack, but do not help a thing that you push. This only helps when strafing in between flings. Don't equip this. Here's all the abilities that I would recommend in any capacity. Really, as long as you got swim speed up, potentially ninja squid, and ink saver sub for those curling bombs, you're probably doing a good job. We got multiple kits to talk about, so let's get crack on! Splat roller. This alternate kit is less mobile and more based on supporting the team and contributing in ways other than just slaying alone, which is apparent right away with its sub-weapon, the Squid Beacon. This is a different kind of sub-weapon, functioning as a super jump point for the whole team with no tells to show enemies when it's currently in use. It's the most expensive sub-weapon to cast at 75% of the ink, but it likely isn't going to be used in tight spots like a bomb is, so it's not that big of a deal. In order to super jump to a beacon, it must be the last thing the map cursor overlapped. It has no D-pad shortcut. It breaks after one use if a user with a squid beacon jumps to it, or two uses for players with other sub-weapons. After a jump that would break it has started, it may still be selected as a jump point at any time before it actually breaks. As long as the jump was started, it's allowed to finish. Every player with squid beacons is allowed to place a maximum of three. A fourth one placed will destroy the oldest one. If it's your sub-weapon, take a beacon and leave a beacon. Keep replacing them after breaking them. Enemies can get rid of squid beacons, and there's quite a number of vulnerabilities to be mindful of. One is that they don't have much health, but it varies from weapon to weapon exactly how much gunfire it takes. Any roller or brush can just roll over it with ease, including the ink brush that normally only hits for 20 damage. Meanwhile, splatlings need to do 100 damage to it, and it takes multiple bullets. Stingrays will break it without even trying. It's honestly very strange, and I think this is something you can only truly get a grasp for with a lot of time. As for other weaknesses, beacons are visible on all players' maps. Once destroyed, any in-progress super jump is now telegraphed to all players by the normal super jump marker. 
It's advantageous to spread squid beacons apart so they can't all be destroyed in one fell swoop, but also because they function as enemy detectors. Enemies within a certain range of beacons will be pointed out on the map to see if it's a safe place to jump to, and by spreading these around through key choke points of the map, you can see where enemies are at all times. That's all the properties for the squid beacon, so on to what it means for applications. This is another sub-weapon that I think becomes better if recon is used to see where they can be placed out of sight and in hard to reach places. These bullet points are all well and good for the stated purpose of the squid beacon, but what if you want to play mind games? Enemies are very likely to destroy a squid beacon even if there is something more pertinent for them to do. Placing beacons where you want them to see is a very viable strategy if you can hide nearby. A more silly use is as a shield. This isn't going to be viable in a lot of situations, but it takes some weapons over 100 damage to destroy it. This is a multi-purpose sub-weapon that gives the player a lot to do when they aren't fighting and can keep the pressure on when the other team doesn't have any good way to super jump in. If there's a bloodbath where both sides lose most of their numbers, the side with squid beacons gets the clear advantage coming back in. When coordinating weapon picks with the rest of the team in more organized matches, I'd advise against having too many players with this particular sub-weapon. Is it really necessary to have two to four players laying these out so you can have six, nine, or 12 of them on the field? Honestly, no. Coming back around to the crack on splat roller and how this works with it, it meshes very well with the sub weapon. It's going to need to hide in safe places to fight well, and often, these high ledges that it likes to sit on make for good beacon points anyway. It wants to super jump out of unwinnable situations, and this gets it right back into spots it wants to be in. A stealthy weapon might end up hiding for a while with nothing to do, and this makes all of that recovered ink not go to waste. It serves as bait, and that rocks when paired with a one-hit KO move. This last usage is something I couldn't believe was real. It's a valid tactic to place a squid beacon at the bottom of a sniper's perch, launch yourself sky high, and clip them on the way down. Being able to attack directly above is rare, and the roller's one-hit kill enables it to do this very well. Since this is our first time talking about squid beacons at all, the effect of sub-power-up is great. It actually gives quick super jump to any teammate jumping to the beacons that it created. And that's downright cool. First sub-weapon that I would recommend it for. Moving on to the special weapon, I always wanted to be a hamster, Baller! This is a sticky shield that rolls on the floor and up walls alike. It doesn't judge a floor whether it's uninkable, but does judge walls. When holding ZR, or after six seconds have passed, the baller slows to a stop and explodes into a sphere of ink. As for the numbers, running over a foe is a respectable 50 damage. The splash damage bottoms out at 55, whereas a direct hit takes him down with one hit. This is solid at picking up those that have sustained damage. The area is smaller than a splashdown, but the special itself is a lot less vulnerable and more portable in nature. Say it with me, it's not a good panic button. Upon activation, it's locked into a fixed animation, and for a fair number of frames, the shield hasn't activated yet. Due to latency and the impossibility of assuring every player has strong internet, the duration of these few frames can be closer to a few seconds. Getting hit removes the tape until the baller is completely destroyed. It's a running theme here that HP of this thing is a nebulous concept and would take far too long to explain every weapon's effect on it. Generally, shooters and duelies are useless against the shield, but it's mere plastic against high damage hits such as bombs, blasters, chargers, and splashdowns. Seriously be careful when challenging a splashdown with this. It's also countered very well by Brellas due to their good damage against non-player objects and their attack shielding from the explosion. The Baller is a loud special weapon, announcing its presence upon activation, when rolling, when exploding, and yes, even when breaking. It's possibly the noisiest anything in the game, so always assume the foe will be reacting to it even when it's out of sight. After the explosion is over, you're left vulnerable and stuck in kid form for a moment. Because of this, chasing enemies into their own ink where they can easily swim away and then shoot you sucks. Have a plan before going in. Exploding at awkward times by getting behind enemies that are focused on one thing and quickly trapping them is often more reliable than just rushing. 
It's a great idea to camp on a ledge that the enemy wants to go near. Activate the baller on top of the ledge, start detonation, and make their heads roll too. In the way of defense, it can get you out of a bad situation that you see coming to a place you'd rather be. The baller's movement speed is affected by weight class, but every single weapon to have it except for two are middleweight weapons. This is one of the middleweights. And ballers are not immune to toxic mist, just nipping that in the butt. That's all the properties and everything to watch out for, so what does the baller have an advantage against? The good mobility, as well as the shield, protects the inkling inside against Tena missiles and stingrays especially well. Since it'll come up, baller on baller action. First to explode destroys the other with a direct hit. For specific modes, ballers show up a lot in ranked battles for one big reason. They can't super jump themselves, but can be super jumped too. This is one of the most loved features, especially in Clam Blitz, where it can get behind enemy lines and score free points by just having a power clam warp to it. Rushing into enemy territory like this needs to be done with purpose to the objective, and when the weapons that would counter it are down. It's only going to overwhelm the small stuff like shooters. Unfortunately, even though we have a this way command on the D-pad, almost no one in solo queue actually listens to it as a request for super jumps. Enable voice chat for this one. It's about the only way that randoms are going to listen to you. A less coordinated strategy is building up the power clam yourself, getting within range of the goal, letting them shoot and destroy the baller, and then throw your power clam once throwing it is re-enabled. Normally the explosion knocks the clams away to avoid special abuse, but a destroyed baller by enemy shots will not explode and thus will not get rid of your clams. Whether it explodes or gets destroyed, it's a good special to use at the last second of a ranked battle where dying to get some last few points is worth it. In Rainmaker, a full health baller will always survive a Rainmaker attack or a Rainmaker shield popping. One of the few times it is a good panic button. Just as much as ranked battles, it should be used at the last second of a turf war because it can be the difference. Similarly, it can color in a splat zone very safely. That's a lot of modes for just one special to have a very clear edge at. The effect of special power up on ballers gives it larger splash damage area and gives it more health. The health upgrade is tiny and often doesn't even afford one more bullet. Let's face it, if it looks like it might break, you're gonna explode before that happens, unless you want them to break it. The splash damage increase is the only benefit seen and even then, not overly worth it. This is a decent special for a roller, covering some of its weaknesses. If the baller is wanted, this weapon has one of the cheapest ballers and is one of the easiest to build it up with its main attack. The kit on the whole is about keeping up pressure so that the whole team is able to make more pushes than they might have been able to otherwise. For the map recommendations, I would suggest having larger maps as more time to swim to the center gives more value to squid beacons. You want ledges to hide up on and you want to be playing splat zones or clam blitz. On to abilities, we have a new one to talk about, Ink Recovery Up. This makes Ink Recover faster, simple as that. No swimming around required to see the benefit because Kid Form also recovers Ink, albeit slower. With the most expensive sub-weapon and a costly main attack too, this reduces your downtime all around. There's a third Splat Roller, known as the Kenza Splat Roller, and we're not going over it today. <laughs> I'm choosing to save this one for later because it's the first appearance of a very prominent special weapon, and it's a horrible weapon to explain it with for the first time because it works nothing like all the other weapons that have it, so we'll see it for the first time on a more traditional weapon for it, and then we'll come back and talk about that one. Where are we going to be rolling off to today? Our battleground is... Camp Triggerfish and Mako Mart. Okay, kids, admire all you want, but keep your hands off the merchandise. Yeah, this is an ink battle, not an all-you-can-grab shopping spree. I don't know, Supermarket Sweep, Cross with Splatoon sounds pretty fun. I am the Hiker Bandit. Or the, the Hiker in the Winter? That doesn't sound nearly as threatening. That's my look, and while it was difficult, I decided to go with the vanilla splat roller. The baller would be helpful in certain ranked modes, but we're not playing ranked modes, we're playing turf wars, I think I'd prefer this. Come on down to Camp Triggerfish! Uh, you gonna start? 
You gotta start. Okay. Uh, do we have all eight players? Yes, we do. It's always so hilarious when the second team comes up and there are only three people because someone's already disconnected. Usually that's what a long intro means. So I'm gonna start off by using my curling bombs here, getting to the center of the map. And the center of Camp Triggerfish is the main thing that differentiates it. You got these tall walls in the back for snipers to stand on, but you also have a split apart center where it's not easy to get from one to the other, usually having to take some kind of side path. Which, speaking of which, I think that's actually where I wanna go because the enemy is over there. I don't see anybody here. Okay, he's up there. You can use an ink rail to get up there easily. I don't think I want to challenge that. He can totally see me coming, and I'd have to be on an uninkable surface for a long time to really go near him, though. But if he comes down here, I got him. Uh, he's got ten of missiles on him. He's going over there. Uh, I'm just going to go over this way and try to get into the enemy's base. That. Man, there's so much pink everywhere, yet I'm not actually, like, running into enemies. Ah-ha! Gotcha! Trapped him in the back there. Any kind of corner like that, any way that you can cut off, any way that they can swim with the curling bomb, that's how you use all three parts of them together. All right, gonna swim over. Wow, jeez. Okay, they really shot it at a group of us. Paint over that. Let's launch this at a precise angle. There's a guy on our base. Can't easily get back over there, though, is the problem, unless I can super jump. Yeah, let's, let's super jump back. I, I got tagged with a tracking right there. I don't want to be like that when I'm a roller. To give you some roller-centric trivia, in the Splatoon 2 demo, the Splat Roller was equipped with a suction bomb, and in the final, no Splat Roller went on to have that sub-weapon at all. Only the Flingza Roller got it. I, for one, am thankful it doesn't eat that much ink for no movement benefit. <laughs> you, okay, there you are. Oh, no, that's not the same guy, but I still got him anyway. Uh, ink rail right back here. I'm gonna use that to get over this way. I'm in a really bad place now. He's not, he's not shooting at me. Gates are down. At one minute left, uh, the gates near spawn will activate. Uh, well, you know what they say about splashdown. It's called SD for a reason. <laughs> you gonna kill the? You gonna kill the jet sculpture boy? You gonna kill it? Uh, I'm gonna go over here. I think he got him. Knew that it was a stalemate. I have drop roller on, so I could be super jumping a lot if I'm, well, dying a lot. I'm gonna hide here. Nothing? You're just gonna. Okay. I'll go with the team. They're spacing us out, which is a real problem. This jet sculpture knows where I am. And now he's dead! Yay! I think that was a girl. Go over here. Reload. Gonna get into there. Ink and kapow! Ah, oh, if it went for half a second longer, you would have been dead. What did I do? What? Are you serious? I thought we had that. Where? I guess there was pink near our base. We lost to a team where two of them didn't get a single kill, and they weren't disconnects. I don't. I didn't feel like they were playing particularly well. We're going shopping, everybody! It's like those old games where you'd run down the aisles in a shop as fast as you could, hitting as many of those sale tags as fast as you possibly could, and getting points and counting it up and comparing your high score to your friends. That couldn't have just been me, right? Uh, we'll go for these curling bombs, get into position quickly. I don't see anybody coming into center right now. They were they were real slow pokies this time around. Going, going, oh, no, no, no. I didn't have my special, I was at 99%! Ah, I got ahead of myself. That's okay, though. I can super jump in, I got quick super jump, and I also got drop roller. I have a lot of insurance here, so I should be pretty good to go into the middle here. Yeah, there we go. I was able to swim. Up. Oh. Get out of here. Not getting hit by that. Not getting hit by my own type of bomb. Almost got him. Not quite. Uh, Going over there. Hi! Closer, there we go! Good, good, okay. 
Splashdown ended up not being helpful. Everything else is pretty good. Mako Mart is, I think, one of the most well-balanced maps there is in Splatoon. I haven't really been talking about the terrain too much. I just think it's really nice. You got those risen up areas at a center that can be useful for dropping onto people's heads or just getting a good vantage point if you're a long range weapon. Um, there's a lot of little boxes you can hide behind if you're short range. I don't know, I feel like it's just kind of the map that doesn't feel like it particularly favors anything in particular. Um, I don't know if I'd quite call it the FD of Splatoon, but it's pretty close. Nice, good one. I'm right into that. And... Hi! <laughs> I love greeting people with death in the morning. And then we got one minute left. We are doing a-okay. I'm liking the look of this. I don't even see too many enemies here. We've just got them pinned back so much. And we do that. <laughs> Hiding up on these ledges is really nice because people have to make themselves obvious to come up. That's another thing I like about this. And they're like not too high, so it's not cumbersome to get around. Yeah, I'll just get out of here. Okay, they're dead. Oh, they're getting back in. I don't like this. I, I, I just get a lot of really paranoid about... Oh, no! I was right to be paranoid. I was right to be paranoid. Holy cow. As soon as I say it, someone's got a splash on you. They're back against their base. Time's almost out. It's something special time. Time to make a push. Together we go. No one? I didn't even see them die. Did they just retreat that far? That's an awful lot of turquoise in the sea. What do we got? Yeah! I got fourth place with five kills and playing a pretty strong tournament. I got fourth place by five points. Good one there. Didn't mean to select another game. I'm just having fun. <laughs> ha, ha! Oh my gosh! That was a good double play. So I was a little disappointed by this. I had a game that was going exceptionally well and did a good job illustrating how the splat roller works and it ended up having a disconnect in it. I'm trying to not showcase games that have disconnects in them if I can help it, just because winning those doesn't really mean anything. So I'll show you some highlights from that game so you can appreciate some of the moments too. Nice one, oh baby, oh but yeah! Got behind enemy lines there. Finally got a chance to pull off my trick play that I like using the splashdown. I got a quick super jump on as well for one of my abilities. Oh! Oh, I swam right up into it. It's always so fun when that happens. You can't get that with other weapon classes where they just accidentally swim into a one-hit kill move. It's great. I'm gonna get away here. Ha! Yeah! Listen to me! I am the hammer! Boom! <laughs> okay, 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 okay. Oh, he went down anyway. Oh yeah, look at that pink! No toilet water for you, we're all Pepto-Bismol in here! And with that, we roll ever onward. Next time on Splatoon 2, we're going to be getting in to the world of sniping. It's a good job, mate. See you guys then!